Well, uh, good, good morning, everyone, uh, and happy Easter. Uh, he is risen. Yes, he is risen. Indeed, indeed. Oh, Martin, you're still, your microphone is still on, or did you, did you still have things to say? Oh, you've turned it off. Great. So he is risen indeed, and, and this phrase, um, and it's a biblical phrase, uh, both he is risen and he is risen indeed are both found uh, in the scriptures. Um, but what is curious about the expression uh, is that it is grammatically passive, uh, which means that there is no blame assigned uh, to it. Politicians like to use this uh, this way of speaking, you know, an error has occurred, rather than saying, I uh, made the error. Uh, who who rose Jesus uh, from the dead? It just says, he is risen. Um, and uh, this is a question I've been dwelling on. Uh, who rose Jesus Christ from the grave? We'll narrow it down to three possibilities, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But uh, a pop quiz question, uh, who done it? Who raised Jesus from the dead? Um, so uh, whatever you're, you're thinking there, hang on to that answer. Uh, and we're going to explore this question um, uh, this morning because I think it has some really profound um, discoveries uh, for us. So it will be um, a, a little bit... I'm just going to remove my AirPods here and just speak into the regular microphone because it's telling me my batteries are low. Um, but uh, hang, it's going to be a little bit theological, but uh, just hang in there with me. I think that the payoff uh, is, is going to be well uh, worth it. Uh, so let's start with uh, a first of a few scriptures. Can you hear me, Martin? Yeah, keep close to the mic. You, you faded away a bit. Okay, let me, what I'll do, I'll just, I'll just move, I'll move it a bit closer. Can you, can you see me there? I can't see myself on the screen, but can you see me? main thing is we need to hear you, so... Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah. I'll try and speak up too. So the first of a few scriptures that we're going to look at here uh, is Romans 8, uh, and I'm going to read uh, just verse 11. Uh, and it says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Uh, and this is hugely significant uh, for us because as we're considering our own imp Im impending doom and death, and we're looking to the hope of the resurrection of Christ Jesus, and we're wondering, like, uh, this, is, this requires a lot of faith. Like, I, I, nobody I know has ever died and come back, at least not that I've been able to in the flesh talk to and say, what happened? Uh, you know, are you, are you really uh, um, alive again? Um, we're having to trust and put our faith that one day when we die, we will be raised back to life again by that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And so this answer here that we find in Romans 8 is of an enormous encouragement to us. Because it's saying that the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead, already dwells within us. We're not waiting for some, for some far off hope in some kind of other distant reality and universe that, that somewhere on the other side we're going to be raised up uh, 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 to, to new life. And, and how do we know? What's the guarantee that, that this is ever going to happen to us? Already we have that spirit, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead within us. And already we are seeing that life being renewed within us. Resurrection is this process that has already begun. And what an incredible thought this Easter, um, that we can already begin to see the hope of the resurrection, not far back in history, not far off in the future in some other realm um, that, that we're going to see it, but already in our hearts today, uh, uh, this, this hope that Romans 8, uh, 11 um, speaks of, that he will also give life to your mortal bodies, that we're already Already seeing um, the, 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 this process of, of sin and degradation be reversed so that each day we can, we can experience more and more truth, more and more grace, more life, more holiness, more righteousness, uh, uh, our speech being more compassionate, our actions uh, being more thoughtful and, and, and others centred. Um, we're already seeing the resurrection and that we have not we have not been given uh, some kind of secondary um, uh, person of the Trinity uh, within us here. We have been given uh, that very uh, person who raised Christ Jesus from the dead uh, within us. 
Okay, uh, the second scripture that I want to uh, uh, draw your attention to this morning uh, is in John um, chapter 10, uh, verses 17 and 18. It says this, this is Jesus speaking. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. And similarly, uh, we could look uh, in John 2. Um, the uh, Pharisees are questioning Jesus after he flips the table. What authority are you doing these things? What sign are you going to give us? Uh, Jesus says in chapter 2 of John verse 19, uh, uh, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up, uh, Jesus says. So now we've got this passage saying, in, in addition to the Holy Spirit being the one that raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus himself raised Jesus from the dead. And this too is hugely significant because Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, I'm going to give you this sign. They're asking, "What? who are you? What authority do you have to be, to be doing these things? Uh, and, and he's saying, I will die and I will raise this temple. He's not talking about the temple, the building. He's saying, I will raise my own body from the dead. This isn't just something that happened to Jesus. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He, he's not just sort of waiting there in the grave, helpless for, for somebody else to come along and, and, and deliver him from, from death. We don't, we don't celebrate and put our trust in and put our hope in uh, somebody that had something awesome just happen to him. We celebrate and put our hope in somebody who himself is the author of all life and is the firstborn of the dead. Nobody had to say to him, I say unto thee, arise. He said it to himself. Even while dead, he was able to, to bring life even to his own uh, uh, dead body. So this is of great importance to us and great hope and encouragement that that he has the personal authority to, to raise himself uh, from the dead. As all were doubting who he was and what he could achieve, he validated all that he said uh, he was about himself. He is truly God. He is truly the resurrection and the life. And he proved it by raising himself from the dead and showing that he had uh, that incredible uh, authority. So the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus raised Jesus from the dead. But uh, the uh, final scripture, uh, and this is, the, this is the, the big one here, and I think this is the most important answer to the, to, the, to the question of who raised Jesus from the dead, uh, is in Ephesians uh, 1, and I'm going to read 19 to 23. Uh, Ephesians 1, 19 to 23, if you want to uh, pull that up in your Bibles. What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked, this is God, he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. By far the most common answer to this, to this question in the New Testament scriptures of who raised Jesus from the dead is God the Father. The scriptures that I gave about the Holy Spirit and Jesus, that's pretty much it for New Testament scriptures that tell us about the fact that the Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus raised Jesus from the dead. Again and again throughout the scriptures, the most important answer to this question is that God the Father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And this, this is the one that the, the scriptures are so keen to press upon us, that we know that the Father raised Jesus from the dead. We've been looking um, at, um, uh, in, in Boundary Community Church, uh, through, we've been working through the book of Acts, and again and again in Peter's preaching and other people's preaching, it, this is such a common theme, God Almighty, his father in heaven raised Jesus from the dead. 
Why is this so important? Why, why is it so uh, vital that we understand that not just the Holy Spirit and, and, and in the Son, if we find the authority uh, of resurrection, but, but in God the Father? Well, that's what we're going to uh, look at here. There's a long list of reasons why the Father is called the Father and how he has uh, obtained and earned and deserved that title. This here is at the very head of that list. This action of God the Father raising Jesus from the dead is, in my view, the most fatherly act that any father, the most fatherly being of all in, in the universe, ever did. It is the pinnacle of fatherliness. It is the ultimate example of what it means to be a good father. It isn't just some cold, uh, uh, forcible, powerful miracle that took place. This is an act that took place out of a warmth and love and the depth of feeling that the father's heart had for his, for his son. He could not, he would not leave him in the grave. In order to um, understand just the depth of the meaning and the love that took place in, in, in the resurrection, we need, to, we need to kind of go back a bit to the question of why Jesus was crucified in the first place. And this also is a Trinitarian effort. We know that all things Jesus did, he did in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we know that it was his obedience that brought him to the cross. Jesus himself uh, 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 he obeyed his father even, to, even unto death uh, uh, and even death on a, on a cross. But it was God who commanded Jesus to go to the cross. It was out of the heart of the father that, that the, the salvation plan was cooked up. Uh, it was it was him that brought about salvation. You know, it, we, we, we sometimes get get very um, uh, uh, focused and not unrightly so on, on Jesus and the person of the son as our savior, that we find salvation in, in him, which, of course, is absolutely true. But we find salvation in the Holy Spirit. We find salvation in, in God, the father. And we see that in uh, the crucifixion. God told his son to go and be crucified. And one of the things that um, I uh, spoke about on Good Friday was just how excruciating this must have been for God the Father to send his son to die. We cannot fathom how much the Father loves his son. We cannot imagine how much God loves Christ Jesus. What a great man, what a good man Jesus was. How tough it must have been for the father to send him to die, to say, you must go to the cross and to see him in agony in Gethsemane saying, Father, is there any other way? Please take this cup from me. It is unbearable to imagine, not just that I would be rejected by human beings or that they would spit upon me and beat me and uh, drag me to uh, the cross and crucify me, uh, uh, but 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 that, that Christ would have to bear the wrath of God, that he would have to bear the rejection uh, uh, of, of God for the sin of mankind. It was unbearable for Christ Jesus, but it was unbearable for his father in heaven. And God had to endure that as he, as he, as he uh, called and commanded Jesus to go to the cross and, and see him so willingly and obediently uh, go. He had to look upon his son, Jesus, as an object of his wrath. He had to see Jesus not as, 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 as a, a lone human being and judge him on the basis of, of his personal sin, which, of which there was none. But instead, God had to look upon his son as the right representative of the church, of all those who would put their faith in Christ. Jesus chose to take up upon his back all the sin of, 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 of the church, of God's people, of all who would repent and put their trust in the work of Jesus. All that sin was on his back. And, and so strong is the union of Christ and his church. I know we're getting very, very theological here, but bear with me here. So strong was that union. God could not separate those two things. It wasn't Jesus Christ who was on the cross. It was Jesus church. 
like one thing. Jesus and the church, so one had they become uh, uh, in, in, in his in his, his, his decision to take on the sin of, of God's people, that it was one unit being judged by God. And that, that one unit contained an enormous amount of sin. It contained all the sin I have ever done, all the sin you have ever done, and, and all the sin of anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And God Almighty was furious. How great has our sin been? What depth of sin do we have that we have laid upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ? We cannot fathom it. And there in that, in that, in that moment, Jesus Christ had to bear that wrath. The father had to, in his justice, un unleash his anger and his hurt, not upon us, but upon our king, our representative, the one who we have chosen to stand in our, in our place. And this is not, this is not um, an abusive thing. God, Jesus is the son of God, but he is no child. Jesus is a man. He is even God. He was well able to make this choice, knowing the glory that was set before him in, in these things. And God, too, knowing the glory that he would set before Christ and knowing that all things considered, this would be an incredible uh, a testament to the glory of the son his obedience here would be his his sacrifice here would be glorified for eternity and it would be such an incredible way of displaying um, the character of his son and that is the obsession that God the father has that his son would be glorified so here we see the judgment of, of, of God against this one unit of Jesus and the church all wrapped up together. And it is this, it is sinner. It is, it is that worthy of wrath because of what we have done. What, what an awful thing for the father to see his son as a curse. And what, an, what a terrible thing that now those who are looking upon Jesus are saying, ah, it is true what we always said about him. He is cursed of God. But that is not the end of the story, as we well know. That is not the final assessment of Jesus Christ, because once that lamb was slain, once Jesus Christ was crucified, the whole equation changed. Something massively significant has happened to overshadow the entire weight of the church's sin. Now a sacrifice has been made. It has been made by a lamb so pure, so perfect, so spotless, so righteous, so loving, so abiding of the law. And a sacrifice so much more valuable than a pigeon or a lamb has, has been made that now the whole equation has changed. If you add all these things together, this, the, 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 the right judgment of Jesus and the church put together now is not one of condemnation. All things put together, all the achievements of Jesus versus all the achievements or lack thereof of the church, all that mixed together, put together, does not form a concoction that is toxic or sinful or bad. It forms something that is righteous and eternally righteous and worthy, not of a grave, but of something much greater than that. And so it was the father's incredible pleasure to make sure that he was the one who raised Jesus from the dead and put him in the right place. So before then, this, this unimaginably large audience, an audience of, of all uh, beings, human and otherwise, throughout all of history, God wanted to, to make this crystal clear. I, as God the Father, have something to say about the place and the worth of my son, Jesus Christ. And it is the exact opposite of a grave. I am gonna take him out of that grave and I'm not just gonna put him next to the grave alive. Uh, what I'm going to do, according to our passage um, uh, in Ephesians, raise him from the dead, seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and all power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in, in the one to come. And, 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 and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. 
God wanted to, 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 to make complete his assessment of who Jesus is. And it is not somebody in a grave. It's not somebody dead. It is somebody a whole lot more than alive. It, he is the resurrection and the life. And he is the king of all kings. He is higher than any name. Name any name right now. Pick any name you like. Jesus Christ is higher than that name. He is greater than any name, um, not just in this earth, all kinds of you know, stupid names that people have that, that are worth nothing. He is, he, is, he is higher than any name, even in heaven uh, and, and in this age and, and, and in the, the, the age uh, uh, to come. The grave is just the most out of place place for the resurrection and the life for Jesus Christ. It could not be more unfitting. And so this is the incredible message uh, in the New Testament of, of, of who, uh, who done it, who raised Jesus uh, from the dead. It was this beautiful Trinitarian effort. Any one of them could have done it on their own. I mean, it's almost like this, 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 this fundamental law of all things. Jesus cannot be dead. The grave could not hold him. Death could not have victory on him. It was just so inevitable. And, and each person of the Trinity just had to have a piece of this, had to be involved. It just, if, they, if they have any claim to be God Almighty, uh, it, 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 if they have any claim to have power and to use that power um, and to do what is right and good, it is to raise Jesus Christ out of that grave. And so each one of them could have and would have done it alone, but they delighted to do it together as this, as, as this beautiful uh, uh, um, uh, just display of the Trinitarian love and, and unity and power. But principally, the message in the New Testament wants to make, wants to make it abundantly clear. The, the Jesus Christ that this world crucified and, and counted as accursed and worthy of nothing, and worthy of death, and said was blasphemous for saying he is God, that almighty God, the Father, the head of all things, said, I will show you what the place is of my son, and it is not in a grave. It is seated at my right hand above all things. And so let us just worship uh, our, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, um, this morning as we just consider the incredible, uh, um, unstoppable hope of the resurrection, that it just there is absolutely nothing that could keep Jesus in the grave. And there is nothing whatsoever in heaven and on earth that can keep us in a grave for very long either. Uh, so uh, let me let me uh, uh, pray and then I think we're going to have um, another song here. Father God, we thank you that you raised Jesus from the dead. We thank you for that sign. We thank you that you empowered Jesus to be the resurrection and the life and to take up his own life. And Lord, we thank you that you have given us the Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. I pray that you would fill our hearts with such rejoicing this morning as we just consider that empty grave and the hope that the worst and vilest sinner of, of all can yet have hope. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.